Man, so today, man, we here with the um, legendary, living legend himself, Hot Rod, the low end, the low end, uh, the low end legend, Chicago legend. You know, I, I know a lot of times people talk about who a person was before, man, but I right now I want to come out the gate and give you flowers on who you are today, man, as far as being a violence interrupter, uh, a promoter of peace, man, and really trying to help out, to help change the narrative for some of these young people throughout Chicago. So I appreciate you doing that, man. Thanks for coming to the Shot Podcast. How you doing, my brother? Man, I'm doing great. It's an honor to be on it. <laughs> it took a while, but now we here. <laughs> sir, yes, sir. I've been seeing you a lot of places, man. It's always been my intent to get you on this on this platform, man, so we can showcase who you are and what you've been doing. Uh, so, man, take us back, man. Who, who When we talk about Hot Rod, who... Who is Hot Rod, man? Uh, man, my name Hot Rod, man. Government name Rodney Phillips, but everybody know me as Hot Rod, man. I'm uh, originally off 35th Street, Stayway Gardens. Lived there all my life. Uh, just lived all over the low end, but uh, never lived nowhere where else. But uh, basically 35th Street. You know, I'm just uh, your typical. Uh, Project Kid, but you know, uh, you know they say experience shapes your character, and you know I, I witnessed a lot, man. I, I was raised amongst some uh, real hell of a street dudes and a part of some uh, hell of a history. You know, Bronzeville got a hell of a history of itself, as far as just not the street culture, but black culture on, on its own. You know, it was the gateway from the south, so. You know, when I, when I really read up on my history, where I come from, you know, 35th Street was like, uh, even when it goes back to the 1900s and things of that nature, and any high, any, uh, high plops to structural violence with the mayor and Bridgeport and the connection of those things, it's just, I didn't know these things until uh, I did a lot of research. So it's a very important place in the history of Chicago. So you came from the Icky, the projects. Stayway. Stayway. Yeah. Okay, you stay with gods. Yeah, stay okay. with gods. How when we talk about stayway, man, how many buildings was in Stayway? So you have six 17 story buildings that range from 39th to 35th Street, and you have two 10 story buildings that borders 36th and state and 35th and state. I come from the 10 story building. 3616, 3618 South State. That's where I was born and raised. You know, with your family, your family started there as well? Uh, my grandma was uh, one of the originals that moved in. You know, my family, period. Like, my extended family came from Mississippi, and some of them moved in in 1958 when it was actually built. So your grandmother was one of the first people that moved in? Well, actually, her sister was, but she moved in later, like 1966. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So, but, 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 stay away, been in the family. Y'all been there all, since, all my life. Since, all, since, man, since the generations man. of cousins, right. uh, cousins, aunties, you know, you name it. I had a family member in every building down there. So, um, describe to us, man, when you was coming up, man, how was Stateway? What was Stateway like? Uh, when I was coming up, man, my early childhood years, you know, it's like I read a statistic that said in the 80s that Stateway was one of the most poverty stricken places in the United States from like 82 to 90. It already ranked in the top 10, but I didn't know that because at the time, it was a loving, caring place, and it was a village. And you cannot understand your situation until you step outside of your situation. So growing up in Stateway, it was a peaceful, loving place in my early uh, childhood years, and, and uh, up until my teenage years. You know, in my early childhood years, it was just one Stateway. It wasn't no separation, but due to... Uh, certain circumstances and things that took place, it became a split and divide. And 
you know, it, it was a lot of loss of life. It was a lot of destruction. And it, it just was one of the most violent places in the city. How, what, would you, what would you attribute that to? Uh, just uh, poverty for one, and more so just survival. Just uh, young men with no guidance, who was raising themselves, had no idea on how to be a man, who was marking territory and trying to be something, but didn't know exactly what they was trying to be. Didn't, didn't understand, you know, that didn't understand what structural violence was, for one. First of all, you got to look at, you know, they 17 structural buildings, and they was built because Mayor Daley didn't want blacks to cross in the Bridgeport. So he built vertical ghettos from the ground up. So we was on top of each other and things of that nature. And it's just, you know, violence is like people don't understand when you're in close proximity to each other, you take your frustration out on each other. So what was your, um, and I like to ask this question, you had your mom in the house? Yeah, raised by a single mom. A single mom, how many siblings? Uh, three siblings, all sisters, I was the oldest. Okay. Oldest uh, male. And then what was your father? At the time? He went with my mom, so, you know, he, 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 he wasn't in the household. You know, he was, he was doing what he did, and then, uh, I say this about, you know, my dad, you know, my dad instilled a lot of things in me, but he was more of a, like a functional, like I say, alcoholic, but I learned some of my uh, life lessons from him because one of the things I learned from him is how to be a leader. He would come through, he would see me with the other kids, and I wouldn't even know he was there, but he would observe to see was I a follower or I was a leader, and if he felt that I was being a follower, he would chastise me and give me a life lesson like, I can't tell you what to do, but it better be your own choice. You better not get led into anything. And he still that in me in the early age. So he would come through, you know, probably being intoxicated and things of that nature. At the time, I didn't understand it because, you know, he would put me on the spot, you know, talk to me, call me out on some of the things I was doing wrong. And I used to be somewhat embarrassed, but uh, as I got older, them lessons stuck to me. I understood it was a method to his madness. So your father, even though he may not have been in the house, he was outside the house, he still was trying to instill in you yeah. some, some character as far as like, man, you need to be a leader, you don't need to be a father. Yeah, and then uh, certain things, integrity, he taught me about accountability. Just, just, and the most thing he taught me about you know, being the uh, leader uh, for my sisters and uh, just about sacrifice. And he's like, man, you're the only man, so the only male, so you have to do such things, especially growing up in this urban, urban jungle that you're in. It's a certain attributes that you have to have to survive this. So you growing up in state way. What, what organizations was over at the time? So at the time when I grew up, you had uh, two organizations at, at the time. Was, I was a shorty when I came off the porch, as they say. You had the Dale Vikings and you had the GDs, Gangster Disciples. Okay. How did that, how did that work out? So I came from uh, the Dale Viking part, you know. Coming up, you know, like, the thing about it is, so you had the Dale Vikings that was centered on 35th. So Dale Vikings probably ran... At the time when I was coming up, they controlled the majority of Stateway. At the time, you know, they was they was the majority. You know, you had uh, the GD buildings, but they was mostly going towards 39th, and then everything that was coming off 35th was Dale Viking. So when you say the number wise, how many how many would you say was on count for the Dale Vikings at the time? So you look at a building. And roughly, if you have three buildings, and you could say, you could at least count uh, 75 individuals out of each 17 story. 
So, you know, 150, that's 200, then probably 50 out to 10 stories. So roughly the Dale Vikings probably was two to 400 members at the time. Were, were the Dale Vikings anywhere outside of uh, Stayway? Uh, not when I was coming up. Now, as I did my research back when they was first developed, they was from state to the lake. But when I came up in the early 80s and 90s, it probably was just uh, Stayway Gardens and the side blocks. You might have Wobash or something like that, but it didn't really go that far. It was just basically us against everybody else on the low end. And what, what, so what, you know, man, and, and their Vikings, man, they, I remember hearing them when I was, about them when I was young, it was like a, a niche click. You, 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 you heard about them, but you really didn't see them like right. that. Oh, Cause I'm from out west. Right. But you, you heard about, man, the Dale Vikings, they da 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 da. Um, what, and then today you don't hear about them at all. What, what happened? So, uh, so this this the thing. Just like uh, any other smaller group, if you don't expand, you know you eventually you get swallowed up by bigger groups, or you're joining other groups. So, in 1992, we joined the Black Disciples. Mm, that's what happened. 1992. Yeah. yeah. 1992, August uh, 8th. August eighth. Now, how would you know the exact date? Because I'm, I'm, because uh, it was a traumatic experience for me. Because when I learned that my fellow guys joined the Black Disciples, I was actually incarcerated. So you got to look at when you loyal to some and something is inside you, and your people make a choice. That's that's trauma and memorial for you. So I remember sitting in the joint. And come reaching out, and my guys telling me they decided to go this way. And at the time, you know, me didn't understand it. But you got to look at the things that was in play around then, especially on the low end. You know, by that time, you know, the GDs was the majority, and they was a powerhouse. And so we had, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of animosity, a lot of wars, a lot of lives had been took and things of that nature. So, you know, one of the things that happened with us as the Vikings, it, it imploded from the inside. So we had a lot of our guys that eventually went GD. So that's why it's like some of our buildings that was on 35th, we had whole buildings that had decided to go that route for whatever their personal reasons, you know. I can't say what their personal reasons was at the time, you know, but, you know, like at the time, you know, it was a growth thing and, and, and gangs had started morphing into organization and concepts. And as being Dale Viking, we didn't do that. And we had a lot of infighting, a lot of uh, older guys that we looked up to that was offering the drugs. And the GDs, I guess, was just more attractive to some of the youngsters around at the time. Let me ask you, so y'all, y'all, your the enemies of the Dale Vikings or the oppositions of the Dale Vikings were who? So at the time, you know, we fought the GDs because that's what's around us. And at the time, you know, the, the low end always had different mobs and different cliques. But by that time, you know, uh, GDs was... Uh, you know, they was they they was making their moves and, and they was like, man, I'm I'm gonna keep it 100. They was just standing on dudes like, man, plug in or plug out. You know, this this is what it would be. But that was really the thing with us, what was what was our undoing. Our undoing was we had guys amongst us who was Judas's. When I say a Judas, if I grew up with you and slept in the bed with you, and then I go to the people that we used to fight, it weakens me because now the same person I'm against is now, it's like saying the uh, the fox is in the hen house. It's like, it, it's, 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 it's difficult to overcome that because these are guys who know everything about you, everything about you. And now they put the guy who you was into it with right next to you. 
we had buildings and now you got a whole building that was once, you know, the GDs was off another end. So now you got a whole building that was once friends that I slept with, I fought the GDs with, but now they're with the same people now that I fought. So it, 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 was, it was so much as like, you know, they, it, 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 it was a, a situation where it, it, it was real volatile down there at that time. Because you got to look at it like a lot of these people ain't just people that's, uh, we from the same organization. They cousins, they brothers, they uncles. That's, that's, that's difficult now because this your cousin, but your cousin with people that's trying to hurt you. And now it's like, man, ain't no love lost. It's, it's getting ugly because guess what? They know all your secrets and things of that nature. And this, this, and this was around, what, what year did this This is like happen? late 80s, early 90s. Okay. Leading up to us joining the Black Disciples. Gotcha. So some would say, some would say, you were the last leader of the Dale Vikings. Is that accurate or no? So at the time, the Dale Viking had, when we was, when I was, when we were shorties, we had many, I say we had many influential guys at the time. And you may have had a good four or five who was the most influential of them guys. And I was one of them. I wouldn't say I was the absolute leader, but I was one of those guys that had a say so and a voice determining on what direction and what was said and done. By that time, you know, we probably had a good four or five guys who was that core. And what we said went at that time. So, so. Just to be just to be super clear, and them four or five guys. So y'all structure wasn't the same as like the GD Vice Lords, the Stone. Nah, we had like, a collective. We had a collective, okay. and it was like, you know, we was the most influential guys at the time. We was the guys that's been there. We was the guys that played our part. And you know, in street culture, you got different type of guys. You got your hitters. You got your money men. You got your organizers. Organizers, you got your guys who's who's plotting, but y'all all to come together like Voltron. The form form is one. That was us down there. I was part of that core. That core. So when you when you was locked up at the time, when you was locked up at the time, in uh, August eighth, nineteen ninety two. Yeah. And you called and got the information. Had you heard about it before you made the call? So, so what had happened is. You know, I had some close friends, man, that was real close to me. And leading up to that, uh, I was get, I was, I was, uh, as I was there, you know, it was whole buildings. Like, you know, some of our guys was going GD. And uh, one of the things that uh, uh, one of my close friends, before everybody became uh, BD, he he became BD. I had a conversation with him. He told me on the phone. Like, man, this, this shit ain't going well. You know, I ain't going to join them guys. But, man, you know, the, the BDs, you know, we, we fighting the same fight. And, uh, you know, I'm over here now. And it kind of hurt me and stunned me because this is one of the guys I looked up to as far as, uh, you know, one of my brothers that was in, in the fight in the trenches with me. Would, would you consider him one of those five? He's one of the core. He was one of the core. Yeah, I, I I say his name for the camera. He's no longer with us, but uh, he's one of our strong guys, man. It's, it's, we call him a uh, big mellow peepie. You know, he was one of my guys, and when he told me that, you know, I couldn't really. It was like, man, you know, I love him, so I I I knew for a fact if he went that route, it's real bad out there. I wasn't ready to go that route, but. I know if he went that route, it was real bad. And I was talking to other guys, and they just told me how, you know, like I say, when you implode from the inside and uh, can't trust nobody, your guys that been on the front line for you, they're now with the enemy. You, It's like, man, it's basically, it was like, man. So, you know, at the time when I was uh, calling home, 
they had told me. Then one day I came, called home, and one of my other guys told me, like, look, man, this is the route we choose to go. This is what it is. And, man, we, we over here now. So at the time, you know, when I heard that I was in jail, you no, know, I was uh, still Dale Viking at the time. But as you know, we was a small group of people, so I was folks. I was up under the six. I I didn't really understand it, and uh, I was like, man, you know, one of the, when I was in jail, uh, some of the GDs, like from 39th Street, 35th Street, they was in there with me, and they got the news. They like, man, how rod, you know, man, your people over here, man, you know, you ever thought about coming with us? And then, you know, like I say, I had respect for some of the GDs because some of the times. The people you go against, the hardest people you go against, you grow to, you grow to respect them. They don't mean you're going to join them. They respect you. Yeah. And you know what I'm saying? It's, like, it's a mutual respect. Yeah, they like, hey, man, we think you'll be over here. You'll be good over here. I just look at them like, get the fuck out of here, man. You <laughs> <laughs> crazy motherfucker. No, this shit, this, 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 like, 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 what the FCC say? Hey, it can't be on you as easy. Right. Like, man, this shit in me. Man, wherever my right. motherfucking people go, if they was saying they marshals on Mars, that's where the fuck I'm at. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. So it was BDs in jail, and I eventually plugged in with them. Okay. All right. So so, <laughs> so you uh, you had already made your transition before you came home yeah. because you knew, man, this what this what this, this, this what the whole family that did. Yeah, this this what they is so at this, this time. Okay. And uh you know, this 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 where I'ma be at, cause that's where my love was at. That's right. that's that's, 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 where where my loyalty. Family, that's, yeah, that's where my loyalty always is. Thirty fifth Street. Okay. No matter where I'm at. <laughs> at the same time, uh, um, GDs is a problem for everybody. So y'all, I mean, y'all felt like the BDs was the only. No, way. not really out west. No, no, with with, with the in the, the low end. In the low end. Oh, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. So the GDs was a problem. So did I say that one? No, I was just making sure. No, 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 no. No, <laughs> no for, uh, so it was a problem on the, you know, on the low end, and y'all felt like, specifically on your set, like the BDs was not the GDs, but still. And, and you know, the thing is, is like at the time, we probably weren't conscious of it, but as I did my research, and if you read documentations, Dale Vikings was always close to King David with, with black disciples. They, they was. They was always mm -hmm. close with him. But contrary to popular belief, when you hear the name Dale Vikings, they were trying to, people back then in the 80s and 90s, they would try to categorize the Dale Vikings like they was a renegade clique. Like, oh, they some renegade guys, and they just came along like other renegade cliques at the time. But the thing was, we had been around actually before yeah, yeah. guys that even, you know, we was actually around before there was GDs and things of that nature. They were supreme gangsters, right. but they wasn't GDs. But they would have you to believe that we was this clique of renegade. We just was a, uh, a group of individuals from our neighborhood that hold on to our name longer than a lot of other people's. We have been around since like 65, 66 and things of that nature. After I started doing my research, you know, I started to being proud of what I came from and things of that nature. Yeah. No, I see. You see that a lot too, like on the West Coast. All, you had all these little, you know, gangs that wasn't crip or wasn't blood, but then when one gang got, you know, big enough or attractive enough for whatever reason, like those smaller gangs that was just independent joined those. Yeah, you know, maybe it's a uh, influence. It could be because some people scared, or it could be money. You know, one of the things, and, and I say this, man, like when I really was incarcerated and during that period of time, I was fortunate to go to Vienna. And when I went to Vienna, that's when uh, Larry was down there. And and and, and to be honest with you, you know. Come to think of it, you know, when you warn and like today these youngsters call people ops. I look at it like this. If I was born three blocks to your right towards 39, I probably would have been a GD and a proud GD. Because you is a what your environment is. I just happened to be born three blocks to your left, the 35th side, and I was a deal Viking. And, and real, real proud to this day. <laughs> but it it was just uh 
It, 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 it just that, you know, you lower what you lower, lower to. But when I got a chance to be in Vienna and be around older guys and I got a chance to be around Larry, I was educated in such a way that it stopped a lot of my tr tribal, uh, the way I think about tribes. You know, before then, I might have said, man, I don't like GDs, so I don't like stones. You know what I'm saying? I didn't understand. I didn't like the ones that I was fighting and what we was fighting against. But their ideology and concept was no different than mine. They just have a a, a, a different name. And so when I when I met their leader, you know, I had a guy that was down there with me in Vienna. And uh, I won't say his name, but he, he, was, he from the low end. He was a GD. So he, he was very close to Mr. Hoover. But me and him was real close because, you know, when you're, in a, when you're in jail, you know, the GD and BD stuff, you know what you is, but you mostly claim sets. So if you're from the west side, hey, we west side or we low end and things of that nature. So a lot of them that was in there, we was under the low end act. And uh, my guy was a, a, a student of the growth and development movement. And he used to tell me like, hey, no, nah, Rod, it's deeper than this. And he just showed me certain books and things that uh, Mr. Hoover hooked them to, and he would read them books. And I wouldn't let my people know it because I'm a sponge for knowledge, but I would get them same books and teachings and learn it and apply it to the shit I was doing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it was, it, it, that's when it, my mentality changed, that it was no longer about gang banging things of that nature. I understood where I come, came from and you know, because of the loss of life and because of the set of circumstances and the betrayal and the things that came from my land, it was very hard for me to understand at a young age, to grasp and willing to work with certain individuals. But as I got older, I began to see that it wasn't the gangs or none of those things. It was structural violence that had us going at each other. I got to see things in a different light. What was your, when we, when we, did, did you ever, were you ever able to have a conversation with uh, Mr. Hoover? Well, I'll be honest with you. So when I was with my guy, I would go with my guy and it would be one thing I say this about the man. And uh, I've been very vocal about my support of him is that I see that he was very interested in the development of young black men, period. It didn't matter if he was GDs, he was Vice Lord, Stone, Breed, MC. If he was a guy that was willing to learn and he was holding court, so he might hold court and talk to uh, a lot of different young guys. And I done been in some of them sessions where he would blow on us and give us uh, a lot of uh, wisdom. You know, nah, I didn't one on one walk with him, but since my guy was very close to him, Everything that he would pour into his guy, my my guy, and see this is the way jail work. If you ever been locked up, you closer to other mobs than your own mob, cause your own mob be the ones out to get you. You you so my guy was closer to me. Things he would share things with me. He wouldn't share with his own people. So I had to learn a lot about him through my guy and what he was teaching and how he changed my guy ideology. You know what I'm saying? I had a guy. And uh, some people may, they had known when I said, he wasn't from Stateway, he was from Robert Taylor's though. He actually was from 43rd Street and he grew close to uh, Mr. Hoover himself and me and him was real great friends. And uh, he would teach me things about, man, you know, cause I used to be like, man, I hate politics. And he would say, man, you know, come to the library on Saturdays to put politics class. I'm gonna tell you how it benefit us. Mm -hmm. But he got all that knowledge from Mr. Hoover. Mm. And when you talk about like it was like you, like what you're saying right now was bigger than just like GDBD, like it was growth and development. It's better development. It's yeah, others yeah. of the struggle. Can you speak on that? Yeah, what I say is like I would see him just grab young men down there, and because at the time I was real young, I was probably 20, 21. So you know, I would think you know, in my young mind, I'm like. Well, he ain't going to tell us shit because we ain't his people. You know what I'm saying? 
And then I was still young and impressionable with his. I was grasping on to learn a lot of things from them, but I didn't want my people to know that I wanted to learn that shit. Because they look at me like, what the fuck you on, nigga? You know what I'm saying? Like, because at the time, they didn't understand that, you know, I, I know now that I was really beyond my time as far as my growth spurt. And I, I began to see, like, man, y'all ass crazy, man. We into it once upon a time. We all used to be all as one, and, and y'all got all these hang-ups. This ain't the shit that we supposed to be on. We was actually mis being misled. What do you think the purpose of, uh, how do you think we start to be misled? How do you think that start to come? I mean, it goes to, uh, man, power corrupts. So if you got certain individuals that's in power, if they're not truly for their people and understand how power work, they use it in selfish ways. And they, they pit each other against each other. They feed off that because they benefit. We got individuals from our own neighborhood that keep up a lot of chaos because it benefits them. Especially older guys and young guys. It's the manipulation game. You know, it's been going on since the beginning of the time. So... If you if you don't understand that, it it's like I got to manipulate and keep y'all going into it, so it benefits me. I'm making the money. I got the power. I control y'all, and y'all gain the knowledge on how it should be. I want at the time they might not understand. It don't weaken them. It it actually strengthen when the neighborhood is because it's the saying we are stronger together. So when we are stronger together, we actually is oper operating at our optimal level that we should be operating at. But individuals don't see it that way. They look at it, if I could corrupt and be a chaos, chaos agent and keep y'all against each other, I could control. It's kind of crazy. You look at the end result of all that fighting, you know, on the low end and like how the low end has turned out. Like how, like you watch this, this change in this neighborhood. Oh man, dr man, dramatically. So, the thing about it is, like, you know, when you say low end, you talk about state to the lake. A funny thing happened to me, man. I was released from prison in uh, 2005. And uh, I was uh, driving down the Dan Ryan Expressway. And I just got out and I was uh, just driving. And as I'm riding down 55, I mean, the Dan Ryan, and I look. To my left, the funny thing is, wasn't no projects, and I never thought I'd see that in my life. From 55th to 22nd, was gone, and for the first time, I felt like I didn't have a home because that's all I knew all my life. You know, you hear these stories about they're gonna tear down the projects, they're gonna do these things of that nature, and you be like, when a kid, you want like how. All this, how they gonna do that? How they gonna do All this? these people in. Yeah, you know. And when I came home, that really started my transformation because I basically, you know, I was wise and understood a lot of things, but my mindset was getting back to it, getting back to hustle, getting back to putting my influence on things in, in, in my home. But I came home to no home. So about that time, you said you came home to no home. To no home, far as neighborhood. Right. That that you know you you know I go like you can be in an organization and go to different neighborhoods because you're a part of that organization. You may be accepted, but that's not your home. Right. That ain't where you from. <laughs> and as you you begin to see that with amongst your own people, you so know. When you, when you came home, what year did you come home? I came home in two thousand and five. You came home in 2005, Stateway was gone. Yeah, it was gone. Shut they down. had one last building left. And ironically, it wasn't my building. It was the GD building. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, wasn't my, it wasn't my building. But, but the thing was, you know, my mom them lived in there. I grew up with them. So I was cool. Like, I, I was one of the guys that respected, but it wasn't my home. You know what I'm saying? So the thing, the, the thing about it is, Around that time, uh, a guy that I looked up to a lot, uh, Mr. Uh, Jerome Shorty Freeman, had by that time was uh, 
working with Ceasefire with uh, T.O. Hardiman. And uh, I, I, he met with me. He gave me a proper, he, he, he brought a proposition to me that they was doing this violence prevention work called uh, Ceasefire. He said, man, Rod, I, I think you'll be a good candidate for this because they got it down there in your area in Grand Boulevard because you kind of even uh, hit it. And you got to respect everybody, you know, whether they, uh, on the low end, you had uh, some some different groups. So you had uh, GDs, BDs, MCs, and Mafia and Saint Vice Lords. Mm. And I had uh, relationships with all those, like respect of all there. Before I left, I was known as a peacemaker. I was known as a guy who would try to uh, compromise and bring clarity to the situation. You know, coming up, you know, I never was the rah-rah guy, uh, the most gangsters dude. I was just a stand-up dude that stood on what I believe in. You know, and more of a guy that played defense. If you fuck with me, then it is what it is. But as far as me, I wasn't the guy that was going for bad or none of those things. But I understood my role in the organization. And I understood this saying, true, because I got this from an a old-timer, that the strong rule the weak. But the wise rule is strong. Mm. And that was always my monkey. So I knew how to lead. That's been me all through I was young. When, uh, when, you, when you did become a uh, black disciple, did that come with some status or something like that? Uh, was it who you already were? Well, me being a natural born leader, it's like, you know, I'm... I'm Wherever I'm at, man, I'm, I'm going to speak my mind and I'm going to stand on what's right. And, and, and I know how to get guys to sway things my way. I know how to get them to see things. So in my time and what I was a part of, everything I ever been a part of, and just to be the truth, I was always a leader. It's always a leader because I'm a thinker. You know what I'm saying? I think, man, I'm a righteous brother. So I know that people wants to get behind me. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm for the people. You know, I... Can you explain exactly what it is that A violence interrupter is a person who has credibility, LTO means license to operate amongst high-risk individuals in the neighborhood that no one else could reach. And if you're from the neighborhoods, you may have a rep, but also you have relationships. It's not like no magic pill or nothing that you get people uh, to uh, change their mindset. It's relationships and buy-in and credibility. Those are the thing, and you acquire that credibility by being a, a stand-up dude and going through stir, certain street tests and passing them and surviving them, and guys look up to you. So you have a certain power and a certain sway where people respect you, and you can and, and you 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 can't dictate none of them, but you can tell them. You got that ear where well, they may listen. And you can say, hey, man, these are the reasons why you shouldn't take this uh, incident any farther. Because you got something to lose. You can, explain, you can explain the consequences. Or if you don't have influence over that dude, you may know someone that does. So you said uh, Shorty Freeman. Right. So you said Shorty Freeman, uh, when you came home, you got introduced to the uh, violence interruption world. Right. When you talk about, you know, uh, Shorty Freeman, he's a, a, a legend uh, in Chicago, did a lot for a lot of different people. You got some people say negative things. We will always try to up, bring light to situations, right? Can you tell us about his character as far as you know? Oh, as far as what I know, you know, his character was impeccable, you know? Man, a, a, a wise man. At the time, you, to me, you know, sort of like a father figure and a mentor. And uh, I had a relationship with him as far as different from the public, you know. Anything I had to ask him, he was truthful about. I learned a lot about. We, Man, he, he, he guided me in the right way. 
he one of the uh, individuals that got me into this work because one of the things is I always been this type of individual all my life. But, you know, we be one things, but we don't show this side to us because the peaceful side is looking as being weak. And he told he showed me what my strength was. He said, man, your strength is you able to bring people together. And in, even in our organization, we need individuals like you. Because this is the true narrative here about stopping our people from uh, harming each other and unifying them. And you one of those guys to do that and never dim your light. Step into it and embrace it. So his position amongst other organizations was a light for everybody to help change the narrative, man, to try to come to a common ground. Oh, yeah, most definitely. You know, that... Most, by the time, especially by the time he came home, you know, all of us have our journeys and what we go through and things of that nature. But by the time he had came home, you know, the guys that was uh, fortunate to be around him and get some wisdom, knowledge, and understanding from him, you know, he most def definitely led you in that direction on, hey, man, we all is one. He said, even, we don't have no ops. Ops is a, a oppressor, and none of these guys that y'all on the block that look like you or uh, come from the same neighborhood as you, how could they be an op when we have more things in common than against each other? And he truly showed us what's our ops, oppression, poverty, structure of violence, systematic racism, things of that nature. He poured into us about those type of things. When you when you talk about when you talk about Shorty Freeman, Mr. Freeman, and even uh, Larry Hoover, and even some of the older guys, I know you probably been around. They it seemed like their language is the same as far as man. This need to stop. The violence need to stop, and we need to come together. Even though that may not have been. The message early in their life as teenagers, as they got older and more mature, it seems like that's the direction they, they went towards. Is that? All of them. You know, I have been around guys like, you know, Shorty Freeman. And like I said, man, like one of the most influential guys wasn't even from my mob that I looked up to was uh, GD's co chairman, Melvin Haywood, Head. Looked at Head like a father figure. I was with Head every day when we was doing his work over in Inglewood. I became a violence interrupter in Inglewood, and uh, I was around Head every day. And the things, the knowledge and the gems that he dropped on me helps me today. He really helped me understand even what some of them went wrong. He told me about ego. He told me about uh morals principles and uh rod and, and and you know i was around him every day up until his death he supported me in whatever i wanted to do and i was just fortunate to be around a lot of great leaders from different mobs and they embraced me and taught me things as just being a black man period that's crazy you mentioned him because one of the og gds that i talked to today just happened he just happened to call me he literally mentioned Head and said that he was crying the other day, just thinking about how much he loved him and how much of, a, of an effect that he had on him. Hey, man. Hey, that was a great man. Like, literally, man. Like, like I, it, the, the things and the lessons, like, when I was doing this, this work, he used to share things with me, like, hey, Rod. You know, I'm getting old and things of that nature. And I don't know how long I may not be here, but it's up to guys like you to make an intentional effort to reverse the curse. We got to stop our, our people from killing each other. And that stuck with me. Yeah, That's, that seems to be a central thing with a lot of our elders that came from these organizations. They want us to do better. You know, when we start making these changes and you see a lot of the 
or the you know uh, nonprofits or whatever these different violence interruption uh, groups together trying to do this work, and we see what's going on amongst these young people. What do you attribute that to? Like as far as like the young people making the mistakes they making the bloodshed that we see out here. It ain't over no money. It ain't really over no, you know, over, uh, they not recruiting. It's right. more of, uh, game, what, what do you, what do you, what do you think this comes from? So it's sort of like, the, in a nutshell for me, I think it's a lack of leadership on the street and a lack, lack of guidance. So by me being a history buff, and I call myself a student of our culture, when I go back, it sort of it sort of remind me, like in the uh, early '60s, late '50s and early '60s when most of these mobs was formed, and I call it a, uh, I call it a, like in the Bible, you know how they have uh, you know uh, like after Christ before Christ, and I call it ASBS after structure before structure, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So before structure, all these guys, if you look at it, if you look at the '60s and things of that nature. And uh, with Jeff David and uh, even older vice lords groups, Egyptian Crows, or those things, they was named out the blocks and things of that nature and neighborhoods. We the Motown disciples, we the Dutch Town disciples, we this. So they were just one person that brought it all together. Or like with Larry, them, we was the Supremes, our West, the Hundreds, West Side. So it's just like now with these cliques, you know, man, I'm an old block, I'm 757, I'm this. Mm -hmm. They under these major umbrellas. But they doing their own things in clickish, and it just haven't been one strong person to bring it all together, like a Larry, a Jeff, a David, and you know, a Booney, you know, even going back to the Vice Lords, Chiefs, you know, Bobby Gore, a Willie Lord, a Troy Martin, you know, things of that nature, you know, a King Neil. So when you look at, you know, you 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 just don't have those type of individuals. That mm, like you know, just bring it all together. So from my study, it's so much is we back in those days. It's just like they say history repeat itself. And so from my studies, that's what I see what's going on on the streets right now. So do you think that the lack of leadership and structure and and the modern games that have morphed into more so many cliques now? Do you think that that's intentional, that we don't have that centralized leadership and structure? Uh, no doubt it's intentional. You know, like you got to understand that the powers that be already have a plan. So when you study history, even back then, you understand the intentionality of the greater plan. And one of the greater plan is their philosophy was always if you uh, kill the head, the body will fall. You know, even if you look at, like, even go back then when they indicted, you know, the GDs, I specifically remember the prosecutor saying, we ripped the head off the snake. You know, if you, if you ever look at that, you know what I'm saying? That's, that's done by design because one of the things is the structural, the, the powers that be power. When you, when you have power and you can control votes, you can control how people move, you're a threat to the system that benefit others. You know, I want, I want to go to this because we got, you know, even talking to you early, just, you know, you've been one of the early supporters of the Shot Podcast, like, it probably within the first hundred supporters. You might have been in with, definitely within the first two hundred supporters. Um, you know, so I know you've been following Paige since the beginning. One of our first interviews was with uh, Steve Hawthorne, right? Right. Uh, and he recently was uh, accused of uh, killing uh, two people. He just caught two murders. And you say you were talking to him uh, how, what, two days before the incident supposed to You know what actually happened? So I believe that happened on a Friday night going into a Saturday morning with him. 
I had talked to him that Friday night. He was he was he was, he was working at this club, and uh, I had seen him, and uh, was walking past the club, you know, and uh, I'm like, man, what's happening? And you know, we had talked, you know, but I was interested in doing a a, a book on my neighborhood, and his case was an integral part of a lot of things that transpired in my neighborhood that kicked off a lot of things. So, you know, he was one that I wanted to get because watching your podcast, you know, you had an interview him as one of the first juvenile lifers in the United States. I didn't know that that he was the first. He was the first. He was the first juvenile since the life in prison in Illinois. And it's so right in Illinois. So I didn't know that. So, but so I'm looking at your podcast, and he goes back to '83, and he talks about Stateway God, and he talked about the young man he was accused of killing. Just so happened the young man he was accused of killing come from a building that I was from. And I knew the young, you knew the young man. Actually, he was one of somebody that, he was older than me, and he was a guy I seen around the neighborhood and kind of looked up to him. He, he grew up like, so I lived on the eighth floor, he lived on the 10th floor. I was literally two apartments from me. So I'm like, damn, this dude they talking about, you know what I'm saying? But at the time, I remember that case that happened in 83, probably was like 12 years old. And unbeknownst to me, I just remember like in the wee hours of the night, it happened and uh, guys ran to the other end where it happened. And it was, a, it was a lot of hype around and saying, man, they killed Papa, they killed Papa. That was the guy's name. And uh, I was like, wow. So I paid no attention to it, but later on down in history, I will understand that that's one of the incidents that I remember, the first incident, the first death that changed my neighborhood. We used to be as Stateway all as one, where you can go visit every building with no invisible lines, because I would hang on the uh, 37th, 39th side. But after the thing with, with uh, happened with uh, Mr. Hawthorne, in the situation, it kind of changed. It was like, yeah, don't 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 go down there, and y'all stay down here, and we stay down here, and it perpetrated itself. So far as I can remember, that was the first incident that I remember that changed how I look at things, because it's a lot of things, like in a project, it's certain things. They had uh, the swimming pool. So the swimming pool was on the end, and the swimming pool for everybody, but if you ever lived on certain blocks in certain areas, there's certain stores that you'll label, no, that's a BD store, or that's a GD store. Mm -hmm. So if it used to be, that's the, that's the uh, Stateway swimming pool, it became it's the GD swimming pool because the swimming pool is on their area. We would still go, but it was, it's, it's sort of like a split happened. And through that split, but through your podcast, I was educated. Like, I never knew that Steve, I always thought Steve was a GD. I found out he wasn't. I always thought he was from Stayway. I found out he was and he wasn't. His <laughs> real through that. So through there, I uh, start from your podcast, I start going to some of my OGs and really digging deeper into the story. That's how I found out. It's, I got OGs who was locked up with him, knew the story, knew what happened. And when he told his part of the story, I wanted to see was he accurate because you shed a light on some. Even as a shorty, and me and him talked about that, that the last night I talked to him, the rumor was a bag of chips. And you know what I'm saying? You know how rumor in the light it perpetrates itself that Paul was killed over a bag of chips, but didn't tell the backstory. Uh, really that happened so I don't get into what he said his story some guys from my end say their story I don't know what's what but it put into context for me how significant this event was in 1983 that happened 
Yeah, you know, when I, when I, you know, I talked to him a couple times. And in my conversation with him at the time, it was just like, uh, what I took away from that was, man, it, it, it's not something that he was saying. What I took away from it was, man, I was being bullied. Right. And I really was kind of scared. I was, right. I was more scared than anything, but I was put in a position to like, man, you better do something to show you ain't no coward. And, and you know, it's funny you said that I got that because you know where I come from, a lot of the older guys, it was that way down there. So I could see it being it that way. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was that way. You know what I'm saying? The, the, the clique of guys I come from was highly aggressive dudes. And that's how they rolled. You so that could that that could be a lot of truth to that. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I'm like, damn. You know yeah, what he, I'm saying? He, the way when he when he said it, it was nothing braggadocious <laughs> about what he's saying. Right. It was just like, man, you know, like, like, he might even told me that time, like he had tears in his eyes, like when he was pulling a trick. Like, you know how somebody like, bro, I'm tired of this yeah, shit. Like, it's it's more so of like it ain't coming from a point of malice. It's coming from a point of defending myself, and and and, and I, I, I'm tired. You making me do this. You whoop me when he said. Yeah, yeah. He said, "Man, they whooped me." Yeah. He said, "They whooped me one time. They whooped me till I was asleep. So they beat me to sleep. I woke up in I woke up in the bed. I didn't even know how I got there. Then he said, "I left that alone. I I really left." He said, "Man, that was the worst that I could have did was leave it alone." I left it alone, and then I'm dating a young lady, and he dating her auntie. Yeah. Papa dating her auntie. Right. And we at the grandma's house, and Papa looked at me and said, man, we was going to kill you out there. Right. And he said, that kept playing in his mind, like, damn, what are you going to tell you? You was going to kill me if it wasn't for this other girl coming by yeah. and seeing us. We, you was a dead man. We was going to kill you out there. And, and you know... Like I say, man, after speaking to some elders, and I remember the tempering around that time, like, you know, like I say, man, I come from uh, uh, some aggressive dudes. Yeah. And, 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 and I can see that's happening. I watched that. Yeah, his, his mother got stabbed 11 times after that. Yeah, I, his mother I, got stabbed 11 times and stayed with I, I can see, like, you know, that happening because it was it, around that time, man, it was like, man, you know, that was a time of kill or be killed, and it was just survival, and it, it was rough. At the time, 35th was one of the roughest places in the city, you know what I'm saying? And, and so you got a lot of young guys, no guy, guy that's wilding. And I won't say bullying, they was doing what young men do, was rights of passage. They was opposing their will on individuals. You know how it goes, it's just like in jail, people be saying bullying, no, this is a place where people imposing their will because they they want their goddamn way. You know what I'm saying? And this is what it this is what it was at the time. So when I when I read, when I say in your interview and stuff, I was kind of like fascinated with it because it really clicked on. It was a part of history that I wanted to know. And when I started reaching out to certain guys, so what happened is a couple of years ago, one of my OGs, I had told him about the, uh, the podcast. I was telling everybody that was close to me, like, man, you know, Steve's on the podcast, man, this happened, woo woo. So I would get bits and pieces. So one day at the state reunion, one of my OGs came to me and said, Rod, I'm like, what up? He said, man, there goes Steve right there, sitting on the bench at the uh, thing. I say, man, Joe introduced me to him. He woke up. He introduced me to them because they had knew each other from Stateway, but they knew each other from Pontiac. Uh, and yeah, the joint. And one of my guys, one of the older Dale Vikings that I looked up to a lot, he said, Man, Rod, right, here you go. He introduced Steve like this hot rod. And Steve had heard about me from guys coming through the jail. And when I started to make my name, he said, Oh, you hot rod, huh? You know what I'm saying? And uh you know, he, he said, man, you know, I heard, you know, that you had influence and things of that nature and the things that I used to do because, you know, I used to get money. That was my thing. And he was like, uh, me and him hit it off, man. And we would talk. We, we would talk and uh, just talk about things. I told him 
I was thinking about putting a documentary together about the Dale Vikings, and his case was essential to that because it kicked off a lot of things. And, and what he did in his uh, podcast, what people didn't realize, he told you the state of things, how it was in 83. He, he actually opened up and told you, so the building that he was from, which is called, uh, some people call it the fourth building, some people call it the ball. I later in my mind understood that this building that Steve was from and where he hung around them guys from, that was one of the most pivotal buildings in Stateway. Because at the time, when he called his case, that building when fully GD, it was like a little sum of everything. If you listen to him, bro, yeah, he said that. Yeah, he said, yeah. He had Vikings, you had GDs, GDs yeah, ball he was, players, right, right. things of that nature. He so played now, baseball. Right, so now when I look at it, Whoever got that building was going to be in control because, see, they building sets on 36th Street. It's called, it's 3651. The rest of the buildings that, that the G's control was 37 and 38th Street, close to us 39th. If you ever know about Stateway, the tray ball is a long way from 37, 37, the building that they eventually aligned with. So I always... And when now it's my adult thinking, I was thinking if the Dell Vikings ever controlled that building, who's to say how the fate would have turned? Because that building was a pivotal point. I always ask guys what was the most important building in Stateway, and they don't know. I didn't, I didn't know it to then. So I started, my challenges kicked in. And, and it was because of his case and the ignorance, like, people didn't know that Steve wasn't a GD. He was a breed. Right. But guess what building he hung with? The, the, the GDs. So it kicked off between. Right. But even though to this day didn't nobody know that, to guys would come from the joint and say, hey, man, you know, Steve is a breed. Right. <laughs> He's like a breed. How's that? The only thing we know about breeds is they in the village by Jewtown. Right. That's, that's, that's our knowledge. Right. Of them, so it was instrumental, a part of history for me, that was very revealing about some things, and it showed like by us uh, not uh, advancing, and when you have some guys that sitting right next door to you, and you're in conflict, and you don't deal with that, the as the saying go, the back door was wide open. And that changed the trajectory of how Stateway went. Man, <laughs> you know, man, this was a great interview. Before you leave, man, before we wrap it up, man, what you got next going on, man? Uh, one of the things, man, uh, that I, uh, I I got going, man, is uh, I got my own organization called uh, LIPS, L-I-P-S, and it stands for Living Peace Successfully. I got my own work. As of now, you know, I'm a field manager for uh, Metropolitan Peace Academy. I actually trained at the Metropolitan Peace Academy, professionalizing the work. I train all across the United States. I go to other cities and train other uh, violence prevention uh, sites and things of that nature. And uh, one of the things that I wish, man, is I'm, I'm really like, I haven't gave up on our city. Mm -hmm. I haven't gave up on That's our right. city. I don't, right. I don't blame nobody or things of that nature. And I believe there's always hope. And I believe if change comes, it's going to come from us. You know what I'm saying? And I think that all the organizations, the things that, if you look at any organization, literature or things that they, it don't matter if you're the five or six Latin folks, Latin king, it was all for the advancement of our people. And it was there. It's just things, distractions come in. When you, distractions is uh, fast money, lack of knowledge. Uh, drugs, all those things stop you from functioning and going on the tra trajectory of realizing we the true kings we are. It it stops us from adjusting our crown. I just want to say one more thing too, man. Shout out to some of my elders like where I come from, the foundation uh Dale Vikings, uh, Navelle O'Neill, Richard Reed, them were some of the founders of the Dale Vikings. Yes, sir. And uh King David, Shorty Freeman, Larry Hoover Head, 
Booney Black and all the uh, leaders that come from the side that I come from, man. Appreciate you, man. <laughs>